Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, October 6th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, now Russia is talking about making Syria a no-fly zone, threatening to shoot down U.S. planes if they continue to act as the Air Force for ISIS, while 44 Afghan troops brought to the U.S. for training go missing. Then, we look at the child actor used as a plant for Hillary, throwing her a softball question. From Hillary to Jeb to the Pope, we look at how they keep using phony plants, because the media helps them get away with it. And, as Nate Parker's Birth of a Nation is released to theaters, filmmakers are encouraging viewers to rise up. Making it a bigger issue than it needs to be is probably Get ready for a new wave of racism and perhaps violence as Birth of a Nation epitomizes the death of Martin Luther King's dream. We'll one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by All the... All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Well, in response to what it's calling leaks in the Western media, leaks, of course, by the CIA and the Pentagon, that Washington is considering airstrikes in Syria against the Syrian government forces. Well, now the Russian defense ministry is actually saying, hey, guys, a little gentle reminder. We've got S-300 and S-400 air defenses in place. They're up and running, ready to go. And you might be surprised by the reach and the radius of these weapons. So they are effectively letting the U.S. government know that they're basically setting up their own no-fly zone in Syria, saying, listen, if you put any strikes, target any strikes there in Syria against the government, you are going to be directly putting our forces in danger. Uh, the defense official says that members of the Russian Reconciliation Center is on the ground there in Syria. They're delivering aid. They're communicating with a large number of communities there in Syria. And so they're not really going to have enough time to determine a straight line, the exact flight paths of missiles, and then who the warheads belong to. They're not really going to have time to, to figure all this out. And so uh, they're going to take it out. If, if you fire into Syria, they are going to sh shoot down anything that comes their way. Uh, they're saying it any unidentified flying objects. So this defense official is basically cautioning Washington. He says, you know, conduct a thorough calculation of the possible consequences of such plans. Now we know, you know, back in September, they accidentally took out a target, which Damascus claimed was a blatant aggression. And they say that moving these uh, missile defense systems is just a purely defensive move. It's not posing any threat. So this is a threat like we're hearing from the Army Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, earlier this week. Take a listen. We'll stop you, and we will beat you harder than you've ever been beaten before. Make no mistake about that. Other countries, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, went to school on us. They closely watched how we fought in 91 and 03. They studied our doctrine, our tactics, our equipment, our organization, our training, and our leadership. And in turn, they revised their own doctrines, and they are rapidly modernizing the military today to avoid our strengths in hopes of defeating us at some point in the future. So as you can see, they are gearing up for World War III, and they have us all distracted by Miss Piggy comments in the news, things that totally do not matter. And let's not forget that also Russia just pulled out of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, a 16-year agreement they're basically saying the deal is off. Last night's vice presidential debate centered heavily around the topic of Russia and in the event of potential military theater who would best be able to handle Vladimir Putin. One thing is clear, the U.S.-Russia relationship has been in a free fall. The Obama administration proclaimed bilateral peace talks over Syria are, quote, dead with Moscow and suspended a 16-year-old treaty meant to reduce the risk of nuclear proliferation. The U.S. State Department threatened Russia over their actions in Syria, and according to the White House spokesperson Josh Earnest, he said, Said everybody's patience with Russia has run out. Continuing on saying Russians have been complicit in the Syrian tragedy. Well, this comes as the U.S. announced this week that we're withdrawing personnel dispatched to the Middle East in anticipation of a ceasefire deal reached on September the 9th. Putin is also withdrawing, only he's withdrawing from an accord that committed both countries to eliminating stockpiles of plutonium. Plutonium that's used as the core material in some types of nuclear weapons. 
So as we can see, as a result of this escalating proxy war in Syria, the relations between the U.S. and Russia are completely disintegrating right before our eyes. I mean, we basically have the army chief of staff saying that our enemies have trained, they've watched us, they see what we're doing, they're ready to strike because they see we have such weak leadership, a weak economy, <laughs> and they are gearing up for war. Now give us a little bit of uh, more detail of what we're dealing with, Margaret. All right, so the Russian reset that was supposedly going to happen in 2009 uh, that Kane alluded to in the vice presidential debate, it failed, and the reason Kane said it failed was because of Vladimir Putin, although Medvedev was actually the president at the time. So, you know, he, he really discouraged anybody from wanting to know the truth. You don't really know the truth or Russian history if you think that Vladimir Putin isn't the devil. We're here, to, we're here to clear some of that up for you, and it looks like the U.S. has been posturing repeatedly for the past few weeks. We see George Soros come out. It was on CNBC right before coming on set, calling uh, what uh, Russia's doing in, in Syria utter genocide, one of the greatest humanitarian crises. Well, in reality, we are the ones, we're the provocateurs. We're posturing for war. White House is saying, Moscow, you're dead to us as far as uh, Syrian talks are concerned. Uh, you're passing a red line. We see Putin exit a nuclear security pact that's been in place for 16 years that says that they will dispose of the plutonium that they have. So we're, we're really getting closer to a line, Leanne, that we don't, it's in no one's interest to be um, right. in this place. And our White House, we know, they're, they're making statements that are really, really dangerous for us. We just heard Millie say that uh, basically uh, he's wanting to engage in this conflict. Mm. Tell me whose interest that's in. It's definitely not in ours. And what Russia has done, they have they've warned uh, the U.S. that uh, they're actually, you know, poking fun at Josh Ernest a bit here. And they're warning the U.S., that uh, American aircraft could be targeted by its air defense systems um, over Aleppo if uh, we don't stand down because they're working with a sovereign state, Assad. Meanwhile, Assad is offering amnesty uh, to rebels that surrender in Aleppo. So we have a lot of conflicting narratives going on. Ours is they're the devil. And uh, meanwhile, they're preparing for, uh, for, it looks like, for war with this drill and now with the shield and saying we're going to shoot you down. Right. And isn't it just incredible that on, on the mainstream media, for instance, I'm seeing that the, the main trending topic is the fact that Sean Hannity and Megyn Kelly are fighting with each other. It's mm -hmm. like, who cares, who cares about, about these this? celebrity news pundits? Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. They are gearing up for World War mm -hmm. III, and then whoever gets in, gets elected, gets in office is going to have to be dealing with this, which right. is why Hillary Clinton hopes to God that it's her, because she, she's been kind of behind the scenes working on this with the Obama <laughs> administration for years. The woman has been chomping at the bit. Uh, she even, when she mentioned Alex Jones, she also mentioned Putin and, and indicated that she was going to, to meet Putin's alleged involvement in a cyber attack with military action. Yeah, that right. really makes a lot of sense. So she's been posturing for this for quite some time. We know that the Obama administration, their narrative regarding the Syrian refugee crisis has failed. And uh, everything that they've tried to do, even entering Syria, the, the U.S. population has pushed back against. So they haven't had the support to do it, or we would have already seen it. And uh, Russia, at the aid of Assad, you know, I'm not here to judge Assad. Bad guy, good guy, dictator, not good, not good guy. The facts are what we are doing, what our government is doing, you know, the, the, the hostile actions that are being perceived. These are things that are going to, going to have long-term repercussions. And I really pray this doesn't happen. But I could see our warplanes getting into a provocation with Russian warplanes over Aleppo. You know, this is what this is the news of, of today, which is much more important, as you pointed out, is Megyn Kelly's stupid hair or some stupid spat or Kim Kardashian's butt. You know, I don't really care what you know what's going on, or, nor do we follow this this type of stuff. But uh, you know, I encourage you take a look at these articles, go online and look at it for yourself because it's there. Right, and we've seen that how they have accidentally taken down Russian uh, airliners in the past. Turkey downed Russian Su-24 jet in November of 2015. So they have these type of accidents, mm -hmm. um, and that's what they're basically saying, is that they might have another accident mm. if an unidentified flying object um, from the <laughs> U.S. flies over where their servicemen are. And, and let's also re recall that just this week, 40 million Russians were taking place in this nuclear disaster mm -hmm. drill. Um, Moscow's basically saying, look guys, we're building these underground bunkers. We're gonna protect our citizenry. When I read this article, it really just made me go, wow. <laughs> Here we know that the elites are building their underground bunkers. They're being prepared. Mm -hmm. But then on the other, other side, people who do get prepared are being made fun of.
and right. called, you know, conspiracy theorists and things for, oh, that's just a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. How dare you? Basically making it illegal to have stockpiles of food and am mm -hmm. ammunition and things like that. But mm -hmm. here we have in Russia, they're encouraging their citizens to prepare for a massive nuclear war. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's astounding that this is the news that we're dealing with in 2016 and the October surprise we've been looking at this for a fa for a pa the past few weeks we understand that the election is 33 days away and yet we're on the precipice of an of a military conflict with a world superpower you know this administration has done everything they can to unravel the diplomacy that's taken place between our two countries over the past 40 years what does that say to you we we are in deep doo-doo here and yet it, very little fanfare. You pointed that out well. Russia is preparing. They're preparing their people. 40 million people taking place in a nuclear drill. Yet we're not doing the same. There's something really wrong with that. Right. It's just like the nuclear preparedness that they w used to teach you in school where in they tell you to stick your head in your desk, which is basically just, you know, stick your head between your legs and kiss your butt goodbye and we'll hold on to your dental <laughs> records. That's how they're preparing us <laughs> because they're quite all right with the fact that the U.S. could be entirely wiped uh. out. Now, here is a really hard-hitting report from John Bowne, where he really gets in deep about what to expect with the disintegrating relationship between the U.S. and Russia. All eyes are on Syria as the globalists, fearing a populist uprising, are pushing the narrative of World War III on humanity. I want to be clear to those who try to oppose the United States. I want to be clear to those who wish to do us harm. We'll stop you and we will beat you harder than you've ever been beaten before. Make no mistake about that. Other countries, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea went to school on us in hopes of defeating us at some point in the future. Mounting tensions with possible nuclear outcomes are worldwide. We are sliding into a new Cold War with Russia as Russia ships new anti-missile systems into Syria. This after Russia held a nuclear war exercise of 40 million Russians, mobilizing 200,000 emergency services and soldiers and 50,000 pieces of equipment. Elsewhere, nuclear tensions have risen between Pakistan and India after a jihadi attack on an Indian Air Force base left 19 soldiers dead. India then then entered Pakistan and surgically struck terrorist camps in Kashmir. Breitbart reported, It is becoming increasingly clear that something serious has changed in relations between Pakistan and India as a result of repeated attacks of violence in the Indian-controlled region of Kashmir. It is clear that each country in a generational crisis era is on a trend line to become increasingly nationalistic and belligerent towards the other, and it is also clear that these trend lines will continue on the same path until they result in war. From the point of view of generational dynamics, it is not a question of if, but of when and with the rapid rise in nationalism on both sides when may not be too far off of course with all of the saber rattling north korea doesn't want to be left out either satellite images reveal north korea is constructing a submarine capable of getting the north koreans newly developed ballistic missiles within range of the united states coastline cnn reported Doing a major test would be a way of trying to intimidate the incoming president. North Korea chooses particular windows that they know will gain maximum attention from the world, and the U.S. in particular. And Iran, after having plane loads of cash and sanctions lifted, is playing its hand. Washington Free Beacon reported the Obama administration misled journalists and lawmakers for more than nine months about a secret agreement to lift international sanctions on a critical funding note of Iran's ballistic missile program as part of a broader ransom package earlier this year that involved Iran freeing several U.S. hostages. According to U.S. officials and congressional sources apprised of the situation, Breitbart wrote in a speech delivered last month in Tehran and translated this week by the Middle East Media Research Institute, Mossan Rafidust, who was minister of the IRGC during the 1980s in the Iran-Iraq war, added that IRGC ground forces are five times better than the U.S. Army, saying, despite all the enemy media and cultural propaganda against us. If America wants to try its luck again,
against us, it should know that we are completely capable of mobilizing 9 million fighters. And of course, China, with its ambition to become the world's next superpower, is readying its populace for war against the United States. In a Pew Research poll conducted with Chinese citizens, just under half of the respondents said the U.S. is a major threat, according to the report, marking the highest percentage among the seven potential threats tested on the survey. The other threats included global economic instability, climate change, cyber attacks, and the Islamic State. World War III is heating up, and the United States is on autopilot. Now authorities issued an alert for several uh, Mexican states after thieves snatched potentially deadly radioactive material used for industrial radiography. The Iridium-192 source, marked XF-71, was inside a container when it was stolen from a truck in Cardenas, a town in southern Tabasco state. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. Sometimes I'm criticized in my own country for professing a belief in international norms and multilateral institutions. But I am convinced that in the long run, giving up some freedom of action, binding ourselves to international rules, over the long term enhances our security. Led by a weak commander-in-chief that has brought military levels down, backed by a State Department embarking on a strategy of foreign policy that has begun a brand new Cold War with Russia, bringing the globe to the brink of World War III, all in time for an October surprise. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, a lot of interesting stories have been making the rounds lately putting out this theory that we are living in a computer simulation. Now, of course, this has been an idea that's been around for a long time. Philosophers have always wondered, is this really just a, a great simulation of reality? Uh, this was a theory that was put forth by a NASA physicist decades ago who said we were trapped inside of a simulation that was created by aliens. And now we have some of the world's richest and most powerful people convinced that we're living inside of a computer simulation and they're trying to do something about it. They're actually like these tech billionaires funding scientists in an effort to try and break us out of this simulation, which I, you know, thank you, Elon, let break us out of this computer simulation. I'm all for it. I believe, I believe it. I do. What do you think, Owen? Well, I think um, it's a bit unfounded <laughs> to say that we are in a computer matrix. Uh, Leanne may <laughs> believe that or not, but I don't understand though. If, if Elon Musk thinks we're in some sort of a computer simulation, then why are we trying to go to Mars? Why are we trying to expand civilization to the stars? Why are we investigating outer space? Because it's so, a game. I would say. We're in a game, so I we might say, as well go to the, like, Leanne, the highest Okay, high. all right. We're in a game right now. This is all just a big game. So what's the point of anything? And now that you admit we're in a computer sim simulation, so there must be a god then. Whoever made this game exactly. is god. Exactly. And that's like the key takeaway with this is that if indeed we are living in a simulation, then there is a creator. Now, you know, one of these things I'm kind of wondering, obviously, I know the, the Westworld just came out on HBO. It's a remake, of course, but they put together this theory where these people don't realize that they are like 3D printed um, animatronic robots basically there to pleasure these elites that come in and want to live in their fake world. But also, too, we have the release of the Oculus as well. So it's interesting how, on one hand, we have two tech billionaires who are trying to break us out of the simulation. But on the other hand, we have Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and others who are trying to trap us into this virtual reality to keep us in the matrix. So then doesn't that kind of wisp away the thought that we're already in the matrix well, if no, we still like, have the choice to avoid the fake matrix well no it's like it's it's mark zuckerberg there's many layers here okay there's a lot it's just like if you were to go out and play the sims and you're you're looking at the sims or something like that and please don't compare me to playing. a sim okay please don't compare me to a sim leanne well listen the sims characters have created a non-gender conforming character so have you ever played the sims i have not you have not played The Sims, so how no, can you even comment on this? I don't play games, because I'm living in a game. I mean, here's okay, the thing, so though. You... I have a natural tendency to be curious about outer space. I have a natural tendency, I feel like we all do, um, to try to master our domain. We can exist on Earth. We can exist in space. 
Now we have to manipulate our environment, obviously, to go out there. Some people think that the, there's already been life on Mars and other planets. But I, I think it's just, I, I think it's a bit ridiculous to sit here and try to say we're in a simulation or the matrix when we haven't even mastered our own domain yet. We don't even know all the things about this Earth. We haven't discovered all the life forms on Earth. I There's many places on Earth that, that we haven't design. even discovered. A lot of that is by design. Uh, humanity was really kind of on the rise, on the upswing. Like, But what happened to you know the Teslas and um, the, these geniuses out there? So we have Elon Musk and these others who have the means. Ray Kurzweil says he wants to upload his brain to a computer and live forever here in this reality. Um, and now we look like 3D printing has come around where anything can basically be created out of thin air with the 3D printing, which is like a brand new technology we don't even know what it's capable of yeah, well a 3d printer cannot create consciousness and that's why i just True. simply I, I don't know about this whole theory about the simulation but in order to, to relate this to news there is some strange news as you were talking about the billionaires trying to break us free of the matrix uh if they can figure that out but there's also stars that are behaving very strangely alien megastructure star baffles scientists as a new study fails to explain strange behavior, this is actually a different video that we have showing of a weird light in uh, St. Louis, perhaps the weirdest light you've ever seen if you believe in aliens. But there was a star that's dimming and lighting back up that they can't explain. NASA has now admitted that the 10th uh, the planet, they now call it a ninth planet because they got rid of Pluto. Uh, but now that they say that exists and is orbiting around us too. So there's, there's mysteries out there. And I, I just think- well, That's um, the thing with, like, with scientists, they try to just put it all as like, this is the truth, that's it. N don't put any other theories out there. And then you're bringing sure. up a perfect point. It's like, our science is, is imperfect. We, have, we, we put these theories out there, but we can't be certain. And that's why we have now these strange occurrences. We thought we had the universe all figured out. But we are learning more every day. But um, I don't know, maybe we'll find out we're in a simulated video game and every breath I've ever taken was a, a <laughs> farce and fake. But uh, I hope that's not the case. I think I'm real and I think I have free will, Leanne. Oh, well, I think so too. But I do think that when we die, we're going to wake up on the holodeck and realize. But you're 10,000 years this, old. That this is Say all it on record just right now. Fun, that this is all just a fun game. Well, stick around. We will have more coming right up. The vice presidential debate, a train wreck for Democratic VP candidate Tim Kaine. Had the lowest ratings draw since 2000. VP debates don't draw a lot of viewers anyway, but the latest only bringing an estimated 40 to 50 million viewers. The campaign of Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine has been an avalanche of insults. Look, to get to, get to your question about trustworthiness, Donald Trump has built a business through hard times and through good times. He's brought an extraordinary business acumen. He's employed tens of thousands of people in this country. And, and paid and a few taxes and lost a, a billion a dollars reputation. a year. As Kane chased his own genderless tail with sociopathic glee. But my primary role is to be Hillary Clinton's right-hand person and strong supporter as she puts together the most historic administration possible. And managed to interrupt the moderator and Republican VP candidate Mike Pence 72 two times. So many families let, let around the country the with options so that families governor, readily why children, children you trust women. Christ. Meanwhile, Hillary was brushing off claims that she ordered a drone strike on WikiLeaks' Julian Assange, while her Clinton Foundation staff attempted to quash rumors that the Foundation's servers had been completely hacked by the mysterious Romanian or possibly Russian hacker Guccifer 2.0. And now, as the Washington Free Beacon reports, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton sought to arrange Pentagon and State Department consulting contracts for her daughter's friend, prompting concerns of federal ethics rules violations. Clinton in 2009 arranged meetings between Jacqueline Newmeyer Deal, a friend of Chelsea Clinton, and head of the Defense Consulting Group Long-Term Strategy Group with Pentagon officials that involved contracting discussions, according to emails from Clinton's private server made public recently by the State Department. Clinton also tried to help Deal win a contract for consulting work with the State Department's director of policy planning, according to the emails. In fact, Paul's home videos picked up Mrs. Clinton, saying she had stopped using email messages because of all the investigations she had been through. Why would I ever want to do email? And will Hillary yet again roll out more child actors, as was exposed in past Hillary Clinton town hall events? 
The first 18 minutes of the town hall consisted of Elizabeth Banks kissing Hillary's ass, after which she decides she's going to take questions from the audience. Here you can see the very first question asked, and this is the question that all of the media is picking up. Hi, Madam Secretary. I'm Brennan, and I'm 15 years old. At my school, body image is a really big issue for girls my age. I see with my own eyes the damage Donald Trump does when he talks about women and how they look. As the first female president, how would you undo some of that damage and help girls understand that they are so much more than just what they look like? I knew something was up immediately. I googled Brennan Leach and found an IMDB page that referenced a movie called Once Upon a Time, Trillium Vein. The IMDB page uh, credits the production company as NPB Entertainment Group. I googled that, I found their LinkedIn page, and I also found this page which shows the address of the production company, located a mere 31 miles away from the town hall. Meanwhile, catastrophic Category 4 Hurricane Matthew hurdles toward Florida after leaving 102 dead in its wake in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Will it be Donald Trump or the reclusive Hillary Clinton that comes to the aid of the 2 million U.S. citizens being warned to leave their homes? Will Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump capitalize on VP candidate Mike Pence's smackdown on Democratic VP candidate Tim Kaine? And can Hillary's health hold out until the town hall debate from Washington University in St. Louis on Sunday? John Bound for Infowars.com. You know, it was about 50 years ago that Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech. And as we look at the opening of a new film called Birth of a Nation, that's going to open tomorrow. I think what we see is the death of that dream. Let me play for you Martin Luther King's speech. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. There you go. Not judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And yet everything that we see today from the university systems where our children are educated, even before that, going K through 12, everything there as well as the media, as well as Hollywood, is there to focus on race, to focus on the superficiality of skin color, to take away the idea that we're going to treat each other as individuals. The other part of the speech that Martin Luther King said before he got to that point was he said part of his dream was that the nation would rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that all men are created equal, that people would be judged as individuals. Here's what Morgan Freeman said more recently, although it's still been a number of years, to Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes. I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. How are we going to get rid of racism? And stop talking about it. I'm going to stop calling you a white man. I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You understand what I... I know this white guy named Mike Wallace. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So what you heard there was Morgan Freeman having to explain this to a liberal, Mike Wallace, what this really means. And, of course, Mike Wallace was talking to him about Black History Month. He said, I don't want Black History Month. He says, uh, where, where's your White History Month? He says, well, I'm not white, I'm Jewish. Well, where's your Jewish History Month? And he goes, well, how are we going to fix racism if we don't have a Black History Month? He said, treat me as an individual. What Morgan Friedman was doing was explaining to, uh, to Mike Wallace what that really means to judge people by the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. He said, uh, "Get stop talking about it. Don't refer to me as a black man. I've got a name. You've got a name. Use my name. Treat me as an individual. But that's not what we see in the universities. This story that came out this week from the College Fix looks at university uh, distribution of a seven-page speech guide. Okay, and This is at James Madison University. James Madison. The father of our Bill of Rights, the guy who <laughs> enshrined the understanding of freedom of speech as well as the rights of the individual. The Bill of Rights is about individual rights. It's not about collective groups. It's not about breaking us into groups. It's about saying that all men are created equal, exactly what Martin Luther King was talking about. And yet at the university, 
named after James Madison. Here's what they're telling people. 35 things you should avoid saying. Phrases like, you have such a pretty face, love the sinner, hate the sin. We're all part of the human race. Or, I treat all people the same. How about that? But they say those phrases are don't create an inclusive environment. So to say that I treat all people the same, to say that we're all part of the human race, that's not inclusive. They say to say, I don't see color, I'm colorblind. That's wrong according to the political correctness, which is really nothing but political censorship, folks. We have to understand the political agenda behind this, how they are dividing us and how they're trying to make us go to war with each other. We're all part of the same race, the human race. Those were all advised against. Those are bad. It's bad to say that. That's not inclusive. See, this is the kind of Orwellian double think that they're trying to enforce upon you. No, that is inclusive to say that there's no difference between us. Just as Morgan Friedman was saying, stop referring to me as this black man, Morgan Friedman. Just refer to me as Morgan Friedman. I won't refer to you as a white guy, Chris Wallace. Can't we do that? No, we can. According to Columbia University, they have a no whites allowed student leadership retreat. This also came out this week. Students of color. At Columbia University, only students of color can apply to attend an upcoming racially segregated retreat hosted by that school that promises to embolden and to empower participants, according to organizers. Does it really embolden and empower you to reduce you to your skin color? Why is that so important anymore today? We should move beyond that, just as we don't segregate people or punish people because of the color of their hair. Why is the color of the skin the thing that we should be focused on? It is a political tool, folks. You need to understand that. They say this uh, retreat is designed for students who identify themselves as a person of color as their primary identity. Oh, so are they going to uh, uh, allow Rachel DeLiesel to go there because she identifies as a person of color? I mean, can you be a white person and identify as a person of color and then be included in this retreat if you buy into their racist madness? Let's take a look at uh, Morgan Friedman when he's talking to Don Lemon. This is very recent. Uh, we have Don Lemon pushing the idea to him for his uh, CNN uh, uh, people that he works for that black people can't get ahead because they're black. And here's what Morgan Friedman says. Do you think that race plays a part in wealth dis distribution or either a mindset that you can't Today? or cannot? Yeah. No. You don't? No. I don't. I don't. Hey, you and I, we're proof. Why would race have anything to do with it? Stick your, put your mind to what you want to do and go for that. Uh, it's kind of like religion to me. It's a good excuse for not getting there. Yeah. You know, I said, it's probably get me in trouble, but... Okay, why would he say, this is probably going to get me in trouble? <laughs> because it will get him in trouble. Because that's what CNN is a part of. They're a part of selling that agenda. And he understands that. He says, look, it's an excuse, said Morgan Freeman, to use the, the, your lack of achievement to blame it on your skin color is an excuse. Work harder. Do something different. Find a different, different people to work for if they're going to discriminate against you. It is a tool of control. It is a tool of control by our government. It's a tool of control by the media. But then let's look at why uh, Chris or Don Lemon says uh, this is uh, going to get me in trouble. Listen to what he says. Oh, but I said to some of my colleagues recently, say, so I know that it's an issue, but I've been, it seems like every single day on television I'm talking about race and it's because of the news cycle, it's in the news, but I'm so, sometimes I get so tired of talking about it, I want to I wanna just go, this is over, can we move on? And, and if you talk about it, it exists. Right. Yeah. It's not like it exists and we refuse to talk about it, but making it a bigger issue than it needs to be is the problem we have. Did you catch what Morgan Freeman said? He said, making it a bigger issue than it needs to be is the problem here, which brings us to birth of a nation. Making it a bigger problem than it needs to be for political purposes, folks. As a Daily Caller points out, an explosive new movie today about a slave rebellion has some worried that it may provoke rioting and unrest. That's precisely what it was calculated to do. The promoter of the movie said, well, we can't control how the film is ultimately read, what actions people may take, but one message has been that there are very reliable and practical steps that they can take. Oh, what would that be? Fox Searchlight, the film's distributor, has not hidden the political motivation, says Daily Caller, for the movie, but rather encouraged viewers to take the film as a call to, quote-unquote, rise up. It pushes the film as a provocation, but a peaceful provocation. The New York Times writes, the film has been marketed as an urgent call to action. 
What is that urgent call to action? The urgent call to action is to rise up in more Black Lives Matter types of actions, more violent actions, to put Hillary Clinton in office because it's all about divide and conquer. He says perhaps the most inflammatory part of the film is the gang rape of Turner's wife, a black woman, by a group of white men. However, this event has no historical basis. In fact, the real cause for Turner's rebellion is a solar eclipse in 1831 that Turner believed to be a sign from God. Now, in case you don't believe the Daily Caller, you say, oh, it's a conservative uh, uh, group. Well, look at the nation. They reviewed this film. They said the birth of a nation is an epic fail. From its depictions of black women to the representation of slavery itself, Nate Parker's film is deeply flawed, historically inaccurate. They say Parker was correct when he said somewhat flippantly, uh, nothing is ever 100% historically accurate. But they say, but how do we feel about a film that contains only a smidgen of historical fact? What if the historical inaccuracies are damaging and insidious? Consider, for example, the film's troubling depictions of a black woman. A crucial turning point in the movie occurs when Turner's wife, Cherry, is brutally gang-raped by a group of slave patrollers and attack the film portrays as the spark that ultimately drove Turner to launch his rebellion. It never happened, says the nation. Isn't it interesting that... The star and writer of this and the co-writer of this were themselves accused of rape. And as we've seen uh, this last summer, Sabo put out the uh, poster showing the provocative uh, film here with Nate Turner, the star with the American flag around his neck like a noose, and put underneath it, rapist. Jean Celestine was convicted, later had his case overturned on a technicality. Isn't it amazing the parallels to Bill and Hillary Clinton? As a matter of fact, even her first important case, she got overturned on a technicality and laughed about the fact she got a rapist off. For Infowars.com, I'm David Knight. Well, just when you think it couldn't get any weirder this election cycle, now it has become the cycle of agent provocateurs, ringers, plants in the audience. I mean, it's not enough that we have dead people signing up <laughs> to vote. But now they're actually having plants left and right to push their agenda as if they don't think that we are going to catch them in the act. I mean, it started about a year ago with Pope Kid, who just magically like burst through the crowds there and all the Secret Service and was able to get his message or her message directly to the Pope. Come on. Now we've got this bombshell with a Hillary caught using a child actor at a stage town hall. Owen Schroyer, you saw this. I mean, what did you think? Well, I think it shows the desperation of the Clinton campaign right now to force their rhetoric into the mainstream. It's so bad that they're going to indoctrinate a young girl into their propaganda. I mean, that is truly sick. They're going to take advantage of a young girl and then make her go out and force the rhetoric that they've wanted this whole campaign that Trump hates women. And Give how, how me a you, break. How will you help this with body image? You know, how will you, as the first woman president, help? It's like, that's not the job of the freaking president, okay? It's, it's, it does show their desperation. They're trying to force a narrative that nobody wants to talk about. You know, a better topic, you know, a more authentic topic. You know, we've tossed these around all day long, but this really random one, she's still, she's so unsuccessfully cannot frame the narrative. But this poor little girl, she did a great job, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. It's not her. It's her scummy little father who gets onto Twitter and then says, I'm so proud of my boo, mic drop. You should see the comments underneath it. Nobody bought it. What a, what a shameful moment right. for him. She's like a, a child actor, okay? So she gets it in to lob this softball at Hillary Clinton. And, I mean, talk about being sexist. They're constantly trying to take it away from the fact that, you know, don't run a sexist campaign. But then everything that gets lobbed gently at Hillary Clinton is all about her, her womanhood and how will she save the country with her vagina and here then the media is just ad nauseum repeating this video of this girl um, talking about <laughs> you know body image and stuff but this isn't you know the end of this or even the beginning uh, it's I know. nothing new, Leanne. It's nothing new. We covered this yesterday, the Steve Harvey interview, where in February this memo was leaked, uh, showing that she actually knows all of the questions beforehand, mm -hmm. and she gets to frame the discussion. She wanted to talk about her grandkids. She wanted to talk about gun control and race issues. You know, right. let's talk about some salient things that people actually want to talk about, not your failed gun policies and what you're going to do to all of us. And then, of you course, know, just like with the little girl, <laughs> that she act. oh, oh, thank you so much for such a great question. Question. She, she did the shocked. same thing with Steve Shocking. Harvey. Ooh. Like, oh, oh, those pictures. Wherever did you <laughs> find those old photos? My goodness. Man. And, and again, that just shows how fake she is. But this isn't the first time that Hillary Clinton has been caught 
doing this type of thing. There were stories dating back to January of this year during a CNN town hall where one of the people who asked a question even said, oh, I see why they gave you this question, insinuating that he didn't come up with the question as CNN suggested, these were random questions from random guest members. Mm -hmm. No, he's showing you that he was given this question to ask Hillary Clinton. And like you said, it's being exposed on social media. Nobody is buying this. Even AP writes stories about how they try to control the narrative of these events before Hillary Clinton gets there. And I'm sure this happens to an extent uh, with Donald Trump as well or any political candidate. Of course, we saw Jeb Bush getting staged questions during the Republican events. But I don't think that Trump is scared to take questions that he doesn't know. I don't think Trump is scared to have a random member of an audience ask him a question he's not ready for. I truly believe that Hillary Clinton and her campaign, probably more than she is, are scared of that happening. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of Trump, you know, not only does she plant questions for herself, but there's evidence that she also plants Nazis at a Trump rallies to start, you know, crazy little discussions. This is one that was ejected, this 25 year old who identified himself to CNN. You know, they're, they're trying to paint Trump as this Nazi a supporting racist and that all of us are these deplorables like this guy. And, and, you know, he was successfully ejected, this man spouting Nazi slogans, trying to disrupt this Trump rally. Well, first of all, that doesn't even fit into the narrative because Nazis typically like him, you know, in the event this tiny little minority of people, French, and oh, by the way, she has her own group of French crazed nuts. We should start pointing those out, but you know, we don't have to plant those. Those are everywhere for her. Right, exactly. And that's the thing too, is that we we saw when Bernie Sanders supporters were being sent to the Trump rallies to go and disrupt these Trump rallies. Why weren't they sent to Hillary Clinton's rallies when she was, she was the one that was Bernie Sanders' opponent at the time. Mm -hmm. So they were basically weaponizing these protesters, just like they're now weaponizing these uh, audience plants to come in with these softball questions at Hillary Clinton, because that is how weak and lame she is, that she can't even handle a question coming from a real person. You saw how triggered she was mm -hmm. when she was asked a tough question there by an, a veteran. And she basically stumbled and was pointing the fingers of, bl of blame, like she is, is wont to do, uh, when she actually had to a real question lobbed her way. Well, and let's not forget that this is Hillary Clinton who uses David Brock's super PAC, mm -hmm. correct the record, to hire online trolls. People who literally get paid to go on the internet, go find videos, go find tweets, and then engage in political discourse, standing up for Hillary Clinton. Or, or honestly, I think that it's reached a point now where they realize that standing up for Hillary Clinton doesn't really, it's not really an effective strategy. So what they do is what we see like with this guy, they try to implant a false narrative or a false image onto Trump or Donald Trump supporters. I see people all the time going on our videos saying things about Alex Jones and Infowars that are obviously not true. So I think now we're not just seeing you know, them trying to defend Hillary Clinton, but also trying to create false narratives uh, in order to demonize the people that are attacking Hillary Clinton, essentially, at this point. And I know you've got more news on Twitter right now, too. Well, yeah, of course, another prominent pro-Trump Twitter account has been suspended. This was uh, one of the members of the alt-right, staunch supporter of Donald Trump, Ricky Vaughn, is his Twitter <laughs> username. And so he was a very influential Twitter account, pro-Donald Trump. And, of course, he has now been shut down. And, and uh, people from all over the spectrum are praising this. Yay, how dare he have the right to free speech? I mean, this is what is happening in our country. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but even that's not it. We're also seeing the fact that if there ever was a time for a third party to rise up and, and do away with this left right divide, it would be this year. And from the very beginning, we have been saying, you know, that we are mostly libertarian site here at InfoWars. And a lot of people have been saying, well, why aren't you for Gary Johnson? What's the problem here? And from the beginning, we've been saying he's not. A libertarian. He's not running on a libertarian platform. He is a ringer. He is a ringer. And now, you know, we've got some news from his VP we, that just underscores this. We do. So obviously, if you love liberty, you're pro our constitution, you're pro the Bill of Rights, you're pro free speech. And you know, even Gary's VP is exercising his free speech, but he's exercising it to bash Trump in support of Clinton. So, you know, anybody who, who dares to say, you know, we love our country, we're, we're behind Trump, we're anti globalist, uh, you know, they're painted as racist, but we've got this libertarian candidate who actually isn't a libertarian in right. any way, shape, or form who can't even identify Aleppo on a map. His VP, his last name is Weld, William Weld. He's saying now that he's going to go after Trump, which of 
course, we're going to see probably Twitter promoting him. Right. And there were videos with Gary Johnson and everyone going, oh, I love Hillary Clinton. She's great. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just a really sweet lady. I like her. And <laughs> when we're seeing these videos, we're like, what the heck are you talking about? It's like they they knew they, you know, that ubiquitous they, they knew that it was time for a third party. The people have been really pushing for this. They saw how strong the Tea Party was, how many people came out in support of Ron Paul and other candidates like him. So they, of course, they had to infiltrate that movement. And that's what we see here with Gary Johnson, who is a globalist shill. And he was trying to prop himself up um, to kind of get in the pocket. If he knew he's not going to become the president, get elected, but he he's propping himself up to kind of be in the pocket mm -hmm. with those globalists there, uh, with the elites that are running the establishment at this current time. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we did not back Gary Johnson for president. Well, right. And if you think about it too, I mean, the Libertarian Party was originally founded and why people like us liked it is because it was anti-big government. It was small government. It was get the political hacks, the career politicians out of power. Mm -hmm. And that's what Donald Trump you know, represents in this election. Right. So that's why I think more reason why we haven't gone with the libertarian ticket. Right. I wanted to say this, and I meant to say it earlier regarding this Nazi plant. The, the Trump supporters that we found on the ground, we cover these rallies, we go into a crowd. They are typically the most gracious, mm -hmm. humble, loving people. They genuinely love this nation, which, you know, seeing something like this, it's so obvious. It is so personally offensive to me um, every time you hear that word Nazi related to, to a very gracious, for the most part, group of people. Right. Well, that's or a like cartoon the oldest. Frog. Right. I mean, it's the oldest trick in the book is just call somebody Hitler and then you can win the argument or stop it right there. I mean, it's ridiculous. And we're seeing through the tactics, just like we're seeing through these fake actors that you're using in your audience. All right. Well, thank you, guys. And thank you so much for tuning in to the show tonight. We will see you here again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central.